Hey everybody, Bob Farrell here. We're in Nashville. We're at 16th and Grand, which is a performance room and a coffee house. It's not quite open, but they're starting to do some cool events, uh, kind of like what we're doing today. And they kind of uh, have given me a carte blanche to do whatever kind of content shows I want to do. And one of them I really, really was excited about doing was talking to the people behind the songs, kind of the unsung heroes, if you will, okay, because the people, a lot of times you're humming along to something and you don't even know whose song it was, and uh, I don't, some, a lot of those guys are my buddies, and they live right here, and this is one of them, this is Gordon Kennedy, everybody. Bob, thank hey. you for having me, yeah. Good to have you here, man. Um, I get to have lunch every time he's home off the road, anyway, with Gordon. We we get we have a little uh, get-together with the, the old guys from early Christian music days, Michael Lamar. And, and Chuck Gerard and all these great characters. And in fact, you and I were there at the first one, weren't we, Gordon? You and me and Chad. Yeah, yeah, it was like five of us. Like five of us. Yeah. Said, this was Tim fun. Archer. Huh? Seemed like Tim, Tim Archer was yeah. there and Brian. Yeah. And Brian Mason. And we said, let's do this again. This is fun. The next time we had about 10 or 12. The next time it was 15 or 30. Now I can't get in anymore. You can't get in anymore. No. You're, you're, too, you're too young. <laughs> Hey, listen, I, I thought, well, I say all that to say, I thought I knew a lot about Gordon because I've known him since the mid-90s, and I knew he was writing, you know, his skivvies off all the time and getting cool cuts, but I couldn't believe when, when you sent me your bio. I want to read for a second a couple of things. I'll let you chime in in a minute. Um, two Grammys, right? One of them for a song of the year in 1997 at the Grammys for Eric Clapton's number one hit, Changes the World, which he wrote with Wayne Kirkpatrick, Tom Sims. Uh, as a writer, he's had cuts on Eric Clapton, Bonnie Ray, Don Henley, Stevie Nicks, Garth Brooks, Bruce Hornsby, Ricky Skaggs, Faith Hill, Tim McGraw, Allison Krauss, Nickel Creek, Peter Frampton, and others, and others. Um, He's a world-class guitar player, so he ends up on a lot of sessions, and he gets to play on the road with a lot of different people. Uh, right now, you're out with Frampton. Doing acoustic shows. Acoustic shows with Peter Frampton. Yeah, we just finished our third leg. We do a spring and a fall show because he you know, puts the band, the full production, in the summer tours. Oh, okay, does the sheds with all the band, yeah. and then you go out and do acoustic. So we just finished our third run, and we will begin the fourth one here in Nashville next March 26th. All right, I'm going to be there, buddy. I'm going to see that. Right. He's played for Peter Frampton, Don Henley, Jewel, Garth Brooks, Faith Hill, Shadaisy. I got a Shadaisy cut one time. Kenny Loggins, Micah McDonald, Leanne Rimes, Bruce Hornsby, Ricky Skaggs, Little Big Town. Oh, my gosh. It's just, it's amazing. I do whatever they let me do. <laughs> yeah, That's I know that. Answer. I want you to tell me, you moved to Nashville with family from, you were raised, when I mean, you were a baby. I was born in Shreveport, but I moved to Nashville when I was a year old. A year old. Okay. So you came to Nashville and your dad, Jerry, and your mom was a singer. Yeah. Right. And her name was? Linda Brannon. Brandon. She went Linda by Brandon. Brandon. And so they just, they didn't have any money and. They just were Shelby Singleton talked them into giving it a shot. You know, they performed on the Louisiana Hayride. I think they actually were even opening, doing like a duet performance for uh, Johnny Horton. <laughs> so a lot. So anyway, what I'm telling you is that Gordon's music roots in around music row and the music business, and his dad Jerry Kennedy was a producer, a writer, a side man. I mean, he did everything. He ran Smash Records for Mercury. Mercury. Mercury Records. Um, at some point, you know, he moved here to be a player, and then he became a producer, you know, along with that. And at some point, he became the head of the Mercury Records office in Nashville and ran it for 21 years. So he was working with all kinds of greats. So yeah. who were some of the people you were seeing all the time uh, as a kid? He, as a player, he played on Orbison's Pretty Woman, Elvis' Good Luck Charm. <laughs> Uh, Stand by your man, oh, Leroy man. Van Dyke. Just walk on by. He's the Dobro on Harper Valley PTA. Um, he played on Blonde on Blonde, Bob Dylan, Ringo Starr, second solo album. That's amazing. And then as a producer, and I think he maybe was like 24 or 25 years old when he produced Roger Miller's records, and so he produced King of the Road. And that's amazing to me. Yeah. Um, so you were elbow and with in the studio sometimes with your dad would I, you know, he would ask me, you know, uh, 
he would ask me, guess who I'm playing for tonight? <laughs> the King. You know, he would say. Wanna go? But, he, but he did ask me one time if I wanted to go to the studio and meet uh, Jerry Lee Lewis. And I did not want to meet him. <laughs> <laughs> I was, I'd seen, he was a wild man. well, I'd seen a picture of him and was too young to understand what that red eye from the camera, yeah. this flash standpoint yeah. was and thought he was evil, you know, Yeah. but I met him and, um, and then of course wanted to meet Roger Miller, which we, we did get to do, you know, yeah. very small kid. wanted to meet the guy that sang. Great songwriter. Mm -hmm. So the roots, all the atmosphere, all the stuff going on around you, you went to, to, uh, Brentwood Academy yeah. and then you went to Belmont. Yeah. So you're a graduate of, what did you study? At well, I was in the music business school there. I didn't graduate. Uh, you started playing sessions young. I was in, I was at, well, I was actually the, the first master recording session I ever played on was a Johnny Rodriguez record. And that was the summer after my junior year in high school. <laughs> so, but I played Not on. Not very many people can say that, Gordon. And I played on Reba McIntyre's um, first top five and first number one record. And those were Belmont days. You know, that's so you're in college and you're playing for Reba. Did you go out on the road with Reba? No, no. I never went on the road with anybody. No, because my father kept saying to me, you don't want to do that. You don't want to do that. <laughs> and, you know, uh, I didn't really go on the road ever in my life until I joined until, Whiteheart. Until Whiteheart. Yeah. OK, so you knew Dan Huff, who's now a big world famous. He and I we all knew Dan, Dan, Dan when he was in high school. And, he did, and he'd come out and play demos for me at the at the old uh, gold mine studio well he and i were in high school together really yeah so we had a group and and uh he was some so you guys were in a band together. oh yeah oh. and he and he was critical in my that's two pretty killer guitar players in one band and he was pushing me i was, I was if i were was any good at all i was just trying to keep up with him he, he was <laughs> and still is a world-class that's great guitar player you know stayed friends over the years he's hired me and some of that stuff you read he hired me to come play on so which i thought was insane because why would you want me to come play on you? Or, oh, man. But he just wanted to do stuff in this. World class, Gordon. I've heard you play. Um, okay, let's fast forward a little bit. About eight. Okay, tell me, you came out of Belmont, and you were uh, trying to get a pub deal? Were you trying to do sideman work, session work? What were you? You know, I think I wanted to be a guitar player first. And then at some point, I thought, maybe I'll write songs just to sort of supplement that, you know, while I'm at this. So when do you, how, how young, when you picked up the guitar and went, I like this? Probably over the course of my life, there was a few times I picked it up where it didn't really go anywhere. I mean, my father would, you know, get me and my brother Brian, those old harmony. Was Shelby older? Shelby's the youngest. He's the youngest. Okay. So he's in diapers and maybe an infant at the point where Brian and I get these guitars for Christmas, Christmas one year. Years. But I mean, Brian is so young that he, did, he was trying to put the guitar in the case wrong, <laughs> but into the guitar by the skinny neck case, you know. <laughs> so we were too little, you know. Yeah. And then we got a, that was the harmony guitar. And then we got a DECA acoustic guitar, you know, a handful of years later. And those stayed in the closet, no case with the GI Joes and all yeah. that stuff. And so those were there, but they were just over there, you know. Yeah. And then at some point on a trip, a family trip to Shreveport, you know, I, my cousin Randy, who was about four years older than me, um, I, w I walked into their house at my Aunt Billy's and saw that he was playing electric guitar and was listening to Jimi Hendrix and Steppenwolf records and all this stuff. And I'm like, wait a minute. I've got somebody in my family that's gotten a jump on me. Yeah, My dad's a guitar player. That right. should be me. So there was a little bit of that starting to happen. Okay. Subsequent trip back to the neighborhood where I went to school up until third grade. And in the middle of that year, moved to, from Gulletsville to Nashville and lost all the contact with my old friends. But that summer went back. Our mom took us back. Cool. And then the kid across the street was taking guitar lessons. See, I just wouldn't have thought all that because I would have thought, you know, I, I probably should have known better. But I just thought growing up in Jerry Kennedy's house, there was just, you know, you, you were foster to the, to the guitar. And, uh, but you were an athlete too. But no, but what you're talking about though, is absolutely 100% true. The memories of the home in Gulletsville that we came up in, yeah. and those are my earliest childhood memories being mm -hmm. in that home, was coming into the basement out of the garage and there would be my dad's guitar cases, maybe an amp, there's an upright piano on the wall right here and a jukebox on the wall over there that <laughs> spun 45 <laughs> records. And so I knew how to reach behind there with a the little toggle switch and turn the jukebox on. Listen to Johnny Horton. Well, I would listen to dad playing 
Willie and the Hand Jive, Buster Brown, Fannie Mae, uh, Roger Miller record. I, that would have blown my mind in Lubbock, Texas, if, I, if that had been going on. I mean, Buddy Holly lived across the alley from me. But, I, you know, I just got to, I was, you know, I wasn't even a first grader when that first started. And I would tool down the, down the alleyway on my little bike and stop and go, well, whoa, that was that. And that was Peggy Sue going on. Well, right then, across the alley. So you, you're confronted with that every time you come in the house. And then that would bring home real, real tapes of the sessions they had done that day on all these artists, Jerry Lee Lewis, That's Roger great, Miller. And, but he also bring home the first Beatles album and the Hey Jude single and, and some of that stuff you would marry into the music. So I have, as my bookends as a songwriter, really my earliest influences are Roger Miller and the Beatles. So, you know, those see, are the I see, set the Okay, the songwriter, that, I love that because I think that that's where, that's the like best stuff to cut your teeth on. Man. Absolutely. Because it, it, it's primo writing. And there was always this desire in me, even when I was a little kid, I knew how to turn the jukebox on and I would lay down on the floor in front of the jukebox and feel the floor shake. <laughs> and, but I would lay there and dream about doing this myself. Okay, so uh, look, capture that age, what that was, you think it was. Was that 10? Seven. Seven, seven, eight. Okay, so fast forward to when you feel like you picked up the guitar and you started doing something that wasn't. Yeah, probably it wasn't a Beatles tune. It was something Gordon came out of. Well, no, I would I would have to skip through a couple of things that were, you know, like I, when I turned eleven, that's when I opened up the Mel Bay Fun with Guitar book and started thinking I'm going to teach myself some things here. <laughs> I didn't want to ask my dad, and yeah. and but here this is something funny though. Uh, That's great. When I came back from the trip to Gulletsville, back to see our old friends on the dead end street there, and the, and the Scott Culberson, who was across the street from me, his father's an Eastern Airlines pilot, and he's getting guitar lessons. And I'm thinking, now this is another moment for me. Like this should be me, you know. So I come back home, kind of brooding, and my grandmother and my mom are there and ask me what's wrong. I said, Well, Scott's dad is getting him guitar lessons, you know, kind of mad. And they said, well, why don't my grandma said, well, you should get your, your daddy to teach you guitar. He's a guitar picker. <laughs> and I said, this is according to my grandmother. I don't remember saying this. He won't teach me because he wants to be the best dang guitar picker in the world. <laughs> so I, I had reasoned in my mind that he doesn't want me to He's play. He's to smoke. Yeah, yeah, whatever. And so, but, you know, at the point where I turned 15, my dad gives me a Telecaster for Christmas, a Fender mm. Telecaster, and that was it. That was it. That was it. Yeah, from then on, that was it. I've okay, never so done anything the, else. When you feel like you came to that spot in the road where you were, uh, man, I can do this, and I want to do this, I love this, and in fact, I've got my own ideas, and I think I want to write something. Mm. When do you think that happened? Well, I, I want, know what happened to me. I wanted to do it before I said I think I can do it. Yeah. Um, just to reverse what you just said, but okay. but I mean it's an intimidating thing all the while, you know, growing up and and having a dad that's done all of that I mentioned. Yeah, you know, I want to do this. I want to ask him, can I borrow that guitar? But I'm also afraid I'm not ever going to do anything near as cool, you know. But he was always great about. That's it. interesting play going on there that's well, a dynamic yeah, I didn't have. And in fact um he gives me the guitar for christmas when i'm 15 two months later i'm standing on stage at my high school playing a show in front of the school you know like a talent show kind of thing and jerry reed's daughter sadina is singing lead and joe muscale's son joey's on yeah. drums and so we're all these second generation kids you know and my dad is sitting on the front row and turns and looked at a friend of mine sitting next to him and said, I didn't know he knew how to play the guitar. <laughs> so I didn't, so I didn't want him to know that I was trying. And yeah, it's so, I, so I was learning quietly off, you know. Were Shelby and Brian the same way? Your brothers? You know, we all, I, I was just talking to just a friend today a about how, no, how creative three of us were to the, to the point where when we would buy some toy that had an instruction sheet with it. We never would read it. We would in completely reinvent the game. <laughs> Whatever they meant for us to do, no, we're going to do this. So that, that became, part of it was because we were sort of isolated where we lived and weren't any neighbor kids anymore once we moved away from Gillettesville. So we just learned to, we're just going to make this up as we Did you ever do a little brother band? Oh, of course. Were you all the Bee Gees? No, we were the Chuck Wagon and the Wheels. <laughs> and we would go back to Brentwood Academy and play. Um, we'd wear the you know cowboy hats that were up to here, and, and wear. And we, but we were always the champions of country and wrestling music. So we had the wrestling country and wrestling. Yeah, country and wrestling music. And but uh -huh. yeah, so this was always. Uh, I would say there was just this 
extremely creative atmosphere. Plus we were getting a box, you know, the size of like this that would come to the house quarterly full of every piece of product that Mercury, Smash, Phillips, and all the subsidiary labels. We're sending out part of to the radio uh, and to the prop. We got those. And so we look like three soldiers with letters from home. You know, I'll, I'll take the Bachman Turner Overdrive Rush and <laughs> Shelby's got, you know, Confunction and Barquets and Brian wants, you know, Mo oh, Bandy and cool. the country stuff. So we, you know, we had that and a dad who, like I said, would do very <laughs> unique. I, I just want to, and you know, this, your bio just touched the surface of it. But when I, as soon as I read it, I just thought that is a very, very unique situation because there's just not a whole, even in Nashville city here I haven't met that many people that are quite like your background you know and so it's intriguing I didn't meet you till you know we started doing some stuff over there by the way that's gone uh -oh. the, the old dugout yeah, yeah dugout's yeah. gone and you were hanging with Brown and Wayne and doing some writing during that period but you had already come off a lot of experience by then you've been on the road with Whiteheart I was in that for years. six years yeah yeah so you you cut your road teeth big time, and you got you started figuring out what the road was about. I mean, that was between 80, 84 to 90. And, 90. and um, was it fun? It was it was fun. Um, it meant something, which was good because I would not have stayed with it six years if it didn't. Because you know, for the people that would say, "Oh well, isn't Christian music just like any other business? You're in it to make money," and I can guarantee you that I wasn't because I didn't make any. <laughs> for those six years. I just but you had, a, at what point in your life did you come to the Lord? Oh, I was, I got baptized when I was 14, but I always knew Jesus because of my grandmother. She would speak to me and to the point of where he was so real that I would start looking for him. And when's he coming in? You know, so this, so from the time I'm little, that's who was talking to me about Jesus was my grandmother. So baptized at 14. Yeah. But <clears throat> I mean, you had a real wide, uh, interest and range of music all around you all the time and, and your interest in, in what you like to listen to was real wide. Mine was that same way. Um, but at the point at which you, you came out of Belmont, I guess, and I mean, did you start traveling with Whiteheart before you got out of Belmont? After. After. Yeah. So I, pretty I soon after. after. After I left Belmont, right at that same time, I was in a band with Larry Stewart. <laughs> And so we were trying to put together this thing. Tell everybody who Larry Stewart. Well, Larry ended up. Well, he ended up after we were doing this thing for a couple of years, getting pulled away to be the lead singer of in a seven album deal with RCA for the country group Restless Heart. Restless Heart. So, but we had Dave Ennis, the keyboard player from that group, was also in this other group. And you know, Van and Dave, the guys that I wrote with, they they wrote Bluest Eyes in Texas right. about my wife Jane. Yeah. So, and I was around. I used to write with Larry Dietrich. Yeah. And, you know, so I was around about the same time. John Dietrich, I mean, uh, fun times, man, real heady times. So after you were with the band with Stewart, you decided to... Well, Huff, David Huff, Huff was our drummer. David Huff. And I had gone to high school with Dan, like I said, and David and Ronnie Huff. And at some point, uh, I'm actually... Well, I'm sharing an apartment with Dan Huff and Mark Gersmel. That's how I meet him. <laughs> And at some point, Dan is going to go. He wants to go to L.A. to do session work. Yep, I and remember. asked me, after he'd been in, he'd done the first two albums in the group, Whiteheart, asked me if I would sub for him for three shows in 1984. And I, like I said, I quit the band six years later. He never came back to the group. And So you've kind of fell in love with doing it. I, yeah, but I sort of just fell into it accidentally. And, okay. But it, it was... I, I remember that time real well. I had already gotten off the road for a while, you know, Jane and I got off the road in 91. Yeah. Kept real busy and all during the uh, 70s and 80s. But, um, so, I want, you know, there was a period in there after you got off the road, you were kind of probably scrapping and scraping to, to make a living. Yeah. And then you started getting some session work, right? Yeah. And little you, by little. Well, and also, you know, that's another thing, too, that, um, you know, I've been a member of the local union here in Nashville since I was 17 years old. But I didn't really, and that was in 1977 that I joined the local here. Um, I didn't start making session money on the card until 1996. <laughs> now, I would do like Reba McIntyre, those kinds of sessions. And yeah, things off like the card. That. But I mean, once I joined Whiteheart, and then it was pretty well set before me this path where I would be mostly networking with contemporary Christian music artists and things. 
And they, you know, I enjoyed the music, but did not enjoy scale, which is the suggested minimum wage. So I didn't really make any money doing session work either for a number of years, you know, until 96 when those labels went signatory with. Okay, so let's, let's, be, I want to look at something that uh, it reminded me of a song that I had on Why Not called I Will Be, but it, it, it said here in your bio that ch uh, changed the world yeah. from 92 to 95. Uh, it got picked up by Winona, but it was a, it was in a well took a while to come around kind of thing. Wayne Kirkpatrick and I had started a band in 1991 because we were we were doing enough session work together, and he and Brown hired me to play on a Kim Hill record, and then he hired me, Wayne did, to come play on Susan Ashton's first record. So now Wayne and I are just me and him in the studio by ourselves. So the, did, did the Change the World hatch from a, a guitar idea? I'll get to it <laughs> okay. <laughs> because, okay. So Wayne and I are in the studio and at some point we just both think we need to work on more than just this album together. And so let's write songs together. Let's, and then we, oh, let's I put remember. a group together. So we had this little band together. And then when we tracked the first four songs for that project, Tommy Sims and Chris McHugh came to play on the tracking date with us. We had four songs we were recording that Wayne and I brought into this thing. And then on just some downtime during that session, Tommy picked up a guitar and said, say, fellas, is this an idea that this group could pursue doing? And he had mapped out these, this chord progression. And he, had, he had a title. He did have the title? So Tommy had the title? He had a title, yeah, Changed the World. But he was playing this already. Did the same thing over the four chord. And then for the chorus, right? Well, and, and as he's saying, is this something this group could do? And what we were working on at the time was like, remember the Rembrandts, yeah. uh, Toy Matinee, I and did, yeah. Beatles, of course, the Beatles, very influenced by all that stuff. Well, I'm sitting there thinking, well, that sounds like McCartney enough that I like it. And Wayne's probably over there going, that sounds enough like Fogelberg and James Taylor that I like it. You know, Tommy's probably playing it for us going, I hope this doesn't sound too much like Stevie Wonder for these guys to, you know, but that's the great thing about this idea and what it became later. It's like transcends one genre, one artist, one style, one yeah. period of time and all that. This could be a 50 year old song, you know, or it could be this week. So that's, that's how the thing started. Um, at some point, Wayne would ask Tommy, put that on tape. Of course, you'll have to do a whole nother video study on what tape is now, but, <laughs> but put it on tape and then let me see if I can do something with it. And that's then Wayne cool. would subsequently write a chorus lyric and then all but one line of what ended up being the second verse lyrics. And then it would go dormant again. And then I would grab the thing at some point from Wayne, where are you on that? And then he would hand over to me what he had. So I wrote the first verse lyric, his missing line from the second verse, and then finished the music and cut a demo with Tommy. So all that was over a three-year period? That was over one year okay. from April of 91. And we, Tommy and I demoed the thing in April of 92. And none of us were in the room together when we wrote so it. So was it on hold a long time? With, with well, Wyatt? what happened was what? is that Doug Howard had been in the tape copy room when I was writing at Polygram. And he left a year before me. I left in 90 to go get a law degree in D.C. And he came back to run Polygram Music. And he called me in the fall of... 92. What are you doing right now? He said, I said, nothing. You sign with the publisher? No. Well, listen, I'm coming back to run Polygram. That, I was like, what? He said, and I want you over at Polygram. I want you back over there because I like what you do. Now I would hand my songs into him all the years I wrote there. And he probably was the last person to hear most of what I did because there wasn't any, a lot of Nashville country things that I was turning in. And he said, I want you back over here because I, I like what you do. And the first song I turned into him was the demo for Change the World. <laughs> now, I said, can that you, doesn't hurt. So I, can, I said, can you get this to Clapton? Let's we'll see what we can do. Well, what happened was Don Good. Potter. Don Potter walks in one day looking for songs for Winona. That's the only song he left with. And he took it to Tony, who put it on hold, and then Winona, firm hold. 
And then a bunch of stuff started happening in her personal life and things. It, it, caused, it, it caused that sad. record to come out three years later. Mm-hmm. And, and the whole time we've been told we're going to have a single with her. I know. I and it, then it. they put out one, then two, then three singles, and it wasn't, none of them were ours. So by the time we were thinking, dang, we are not going to get a single, I'm sitting in the studio, the dugout with mm-hmm. Tommy one day working on a Nicole Smith record. And he just casually says to me, GK, we're going to get another cut on Change the World. I said, really, who? He said, Eric Clapton. <laughs> I'm like, oh, my gosh. That's what I do. You just not telling me? Right. So, no, that's what I said to Doug Howard the day I turned it in three years before that. Dude, why so, didn't you give me this to begin with? So, it was just happening right then, summer of 96. So, spring of 92, demo. Summer of 96, cut comes out, movie comes out. That fall, nominated. Phenomenon. And right. then go to the Grammys the following Phenomenon. February. Phenomenon. 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 Good job. Great movie. Yeah. Yeah, hit movie. Yeah. So, Feel good movie. But it was, um, you know. It's, a, it's always a process, isn't it? Uh, yeah. Okay, here, here's the deal that I'm going to have to do. We're going to have to do another little, because we've talked a lot, but I want to talk to you about process a little bit. So okay, sure. is it okay if we do another deal? But I wanted, I wanted to get at, at the end of this one, um, should I keep this or put it, holster it, or what? You, you can hang on to it for a sec. Okay, because we're, don't we're gonna, holster it, brother. You just keep it okay. there. Just keep it right there. Because, right. you know, after after this stuff started happening to you, the kind of the, everything blew up in a way. Yeah, different. You, the, yeah, all people the, called me for a different reason after all, that. Re, all the different reasons as a writer, as a player. You started working with – okay, did you start working with, uh, with Skaggs, really, before you started working with Peter Frampton? I knew who he was. I was at the session for Reba McIntyre that my dad hired Ricky to come sing a duet with her. This is in the early 80s. Right. And he came in and sang a, the harmony part with her on a song called Small Two Bedroom Starter. And I remember as he was leaving, dad said to me, take note of that guy. He won't be available to do this kind of thing again at very much longer. He knew he was going to blow up and be this big star. So I, And I was such a fan of his. But I mean, I just remained this fan for years and years. And then to be honest with you, I realized when it got to be like the mid 2000s or so that I I found myself saying out loud to a few people on my bucket list before that was a term. I want to get a song recorded by Ricky Skaggs. I've just been such a fan of his over the years. So the first time it happened was when he did the duet record with Bruce Hornsby. Yeah. And cool album. Yeah. So I won't go into the whole story about how it happened, but that's the first time I did. And then he called me and said uh, about the song that he and Bruce had cut of mine and Phil Madeira's. Mm -hmm. He said, can you, would you be able to go to bring your dad's Dobro down here, you know, for that song? And I thought he wanted to borrow it because my dad's Dobro is a fretted Dobro. You don't play it with the, like this, you know. You don't play any lamp. No, it's a fretted dobro, and it's on Harbor Valley PTA. All those licks he was doing on a dobro, and a fretted dobro. And so I thought, well, Ricky wants to use that dobro. So I went and got the thing out of the Musicians Hall of Fame and Museum down. So it was like, this is like 2007 or eight and take the dobro out to the studio and say, here it is boss. You know, and he goes, he just oh. says, sit down he and said, play no, it. son, I want you to play that thing. You know, <laughs> so now I'm freaking out, you know? Yeah. But anyway, so that's the first time I'm working with Ricky Skaggs on something. And then a few years would go by and one of his, uh, assistants out there at the studio, Lee Groich, um, good man. He, 2010 he, mosaic. Yeah. Well, in Oh nine, Lee calls me and said, have you got any songs for Ricky's next record? Well, oh, and of course you do. Of course you do. You're a songwriter. Of course you do. Of course I do. And then you hang up the phone and go, what, I, you know, what can I do? So I put together these songs, about 10, 12 songs on a CD that I thought, if he likes the song enough, he can persuade it bluegrass. But for some crazy reason, Bob, I put these three songs on the front of the CD that were completely... Not bluegrass. No. And I was writing for maybe what I thought might at the time be the next Dogs of Peace record. Yeah, people so, may not. I wanted to mention that because people may not know about Dogs of Peace. Well, we it. we ended up doing one and releasing it this past April. But the, so these three songs that I had on that CD, I was thinking in my mind might be the jump start for that next project. Yeah. And when I sent the CD a couple weeks later, I sent it through Lee. He called me a couple weeks later and said, 
Man, I love these first three songs on here, but that's not what Ricky's looking for. Is okay if I make a new CD and put the rest of the songs on that CD and give that to Ricky. He's thinking, don't cloud the issue. Yeah, don't, don't. I said, absolutely, thanks for taking the time to do it. And then two months go by. He calls me again and said, well, Ricky never heard you sent first. He wants to do those first three songs. I said, how's he going to do those bluegrass? Well, he's going to call you later. And he did. I said, how are you going to do these songs bluegrass? I'm not. I'm going to do them just like your demo. I need you to come help produce the record with me. And so that's, that's how Mosaic started. That's so, unreal. So now I'm working with Ricky All Skaggs. the way up in Ricky yeah, and it, it, it was... It's the most powerful project to, I've ever been a part of. Country. And he'll tell you the same thing. We was experienced that something that amazing. Got, there was a claim. Was it? it was uh, nominated for. Yeah, yeah. It was nominated for a song. that had one song on there that was song nominated for Gospel Song of the Year. And that was but just, your other Grammy in 2007 was for a Frampton. Instrumental album. Instrumental record. Yeah. Fingerprints. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if we can. We may have to do another show, Gordon, because I wasn't expecting to all.